Okay, good morning. I hope everybody can hear me. Yeah, good morning. All right, thank you so much. Um, welcome everyone to our SIF Meteorological Virtual Seminar Series. Today we have a very renowned um, personality to give us this um, beautiful talk. And um, he's in the name of Dr. Frederick Otulabi, who um, had his first degree um, in meteorology at the KNUST, and then had his second degree in the University of Reading. His PhD was mainly based on plant atmospheric interaction at the University of Lancaster. And today his topic is titled Drought Impact on Forest Gas Exchange in Present and Future Climates. So without wasting much time, I am going to give the floor to our speaker. So I'm going to unshare so that he can come in and then present his work. Thank you. The floor is yours, Dr. Frederick Uslavi. All right. Um, thanks, Sami, for um, that nice introduction. Um, I hope everybody can see my screen. Sure, I can see your screen. Okay. So, uh, yes, as, as Sami has, as, as Sami has um, already stated, um, I am very familiar with um, most people on this call because um, I, I, I am part of um, GMET myself, having worked with GMET for several years before uh, leaving for my PhD uh, at Lancaster University. And uh, my background, again, as Sami has said, is mostly in meteorology. In the course of my um, PhD studies, I have swayed a bit towards um, looking at forest um, gas exchange and atmosphere biosphere interactions. And so that's what um, I'll be talking about um, today. And to begin with, I, I just want to say um, uh, thank you to my two supervisors who worked with me mostly on my PhD thesis. Um, Kirsty Ashworth and Oliver Wild, both from the Lancaster University. And uh, why atmosphere biosphere interactions and, and why should we uh, worry about it? Well, I've got a schematic here that um, a very simplified version of what atmosphere biosphere interactions is. So we, we have the atmosphere above and, and here I'm, I'm focusing mostly on plants. The biosphere basically refers to the part of the um, earth system where living things exist. So we're talking about humans, animals, and so on. But for, for this um, presentation, I'll be focusing mostly on um, plants and in particular forests. So forests, as we know, are, are responsible for um, putting out oxygen, uh, into the atmosphere, they take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, um, and then uh, solar radiation. Um, they also require soil moisture, so rainfall and things like that. And in, in, in return, they put out oxygen, water vapor, um, and they also emit a lot of volatile organic compounds. Now, these are important for controlling the hydrological cycle, for controlling atmospheric chemistry and air pollution, air quality. Uh, so going back to uh, the presentation, why, why are we worried about forests uh, and, and, the, and its role in, in uh, the atmosphere biosphere interactions? Well, I've got a plot here on the left showing um, global distribution of forest and how forest cover has changed um, over uh, the last few years. And basically forest cover a large part of uh, the Earth's 
surface, the, 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 the land surface, about 32% of uh, the Earth's land surface is covered by forest. Um, forests are responsible for taking up a large amount of carbon from the atmosphere every year. Um, and forest cover is affected by land use and land use change. So um, globally, there's a lot of effort to um, do afforestation and reforestation as part of climate change mitigation programs. Um, and indeed, at the last COP26, uh, um, there was a, uh, a pledge by nations, about 100 nations, to protect existing forests, all uh, due to the, the, the great role that um, forests play in the global climate system. Um, obviously, changes in forest cover due to afforestation and so on um, can have impact on agricultural output and food availability. If, you, if you're taking um, land that is for agriculture, for example, and turning it into a forest, then you are likely to reduce um, food production, which has implications for food security and others. So um, due to its importance in, in the atmosphere and, and climate, um, there are several measurement sites um, that continuously monitor forest productivity. So um, things like how much carbon dioxide the forest is taking in, how much water vapor that forest is pumping into the atmosphere. Um, and this is being done routinely across the world. And so uh, what you see on the left uh, some each circle indicates um, a station that's making continuous measurement. Um, it's worthy to note that uh, across the tropics where most of the uh, forest can be found, um, the data is, is uh, very sparse. So um, to, to study uh, the role of um, atmosphere biosphere interactions on um, trees, gas emissions, and so on. Um, we have those measurement sites represented by these towers um, in forest environments. And you can also have models, um, so one dimensional models or canopy models, and you can also have land surface models. And then you have the observations. Uh, and, and so you go through a process of using the observations to try and run the models. And then depending on what you find, you can then go back and do more observations to try and better understand what is happening um, at the forest ecosystem level. So it's, it's, a, it's a loop, if you like, of running models, understanding the observations, finding out where the models are failing, and then using the observations to try and um, improve the models and then you go back uh, and forth between these various processes. And, and that's what um, my presentation is going to be about mostly. Um, so as I've said, we're, we're basically going to focus on drought impact on BVOC emissions, particularly isoprene. And I'll come to why isoprene is important in a moment. Um, and also on plant productivity. And plant productivity here, we're talking about photosynthesis. So how much carbon is the forest actually taking out of the atmosphere? And how is drought affecting the ability of plants to um, undertake this very important um, process? And, and the reason we have to worry about drought impact on forests is because um, Plants are sessile, which, which simply means that they can't move. For us as humans, if, if there's um, a heat wave, uh, there's, a, there's um, some stress factor, we can move from one place to another. If there's, if there's floods, you can move to higher grounds and so on. Plants don't have that um, luxury. They have to be where they are at all times. And so they have to develop certain uh, mechanisms and defense uh, uh, mechanisms to be able to cope or tolerate um, these uh, stress factors, uh, which includes 
closing their stomata. So uh, the stomata are those very small um, holes in the leaf that allows carbon dioxide to come into the, the leaf and also oxygen and water vapor to leave. So if, if there's heat or drought, for example, that stomata can be closed to avoid um, uh, dehydrative stress. They also emit DVOCs, um, including isoprene, um, as a way of dealing with heat stress. Um, because if they don't do that, then the plants could either wilt, um, as, as indicated by the image, or uh, in, in extreme instances, the, the plant could simply die. So drought uh, is, is a key abiotic um, stress negatively affecting plant growth and, and um, productivity. And it, it, as I've already indicated, um, during drought, the plant has to shut its um, stomata. And if it does that, it means it's not taking in the carbon dioxide that it needs. And if it's not taking in the carbon dioxide that it needs, it simply means the plant cannot grow and be productive. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about two studies. Um, the first of which is how drought affects isoprene emissions, which is a BVOC. And then the second will be about how plants, uh, drought affects plant uh, productivity. Now, isoprene is, is, is important in um, the global climate system because it is the most abundant BVOC emitted by um, terrestrial um, vegetation. Uh, it, plants emit isoprene, as I've already stated, to protect against biotic and abiotic stress. They also emit these um, BVOCs as a way of communicating. Sometimes they use it to communicate to um, pollinators, for example, that uh, I'm ready to be pollinated or to communicate with other plants. For example, when there's a stress, certain um, BVOCs can be emitted to tell the other plants that this stress is, is ongoing uh, so they can also turn on their defensive uh, mechanisms. Um, plants, as we see them, are very, very intelligent. Um, there, there, there are so many things they do in order to cope. Um, and, and isoprene is very important because it, it also has impact on the climate. So its, it's um, reactions can lead to the formation of ozone, which is a greenhouse gas itself. Uh, isoprene can also lead to the formation of secondary organic aerosols, which serve as um, cloud condensation nuclei. So that will help in cloud formation. And as we know, clouds, depending on, on their height and their type, can either lead to cooling or warming of the surface. So that's a very important part of the global climate system. Um, so the study I'm discussing here um, is uh, due to a measurement we made in, in, uh, in Oxford, um, southern part of England during a heat wave and drought period in um, 2018. So, most parts of the UK in 2018 in the summer experienced prolonged drought and heat wave, um, which lasted throughout the summer. Um, lots of places had temperatures going more than two degrees above the, the, the mean for the season um, and rainfall declined by uh, a lot in, in most places, up, up to 90% for the season. In, in some places. Um, and these changes had impacts on BVOC emissions. And we were out there making some measurements uh, in a forest. And so it's a combination of those measurements and, and, um, and models that I'll be, I'll be um, explaining to you in a moment. So we make the measurements at uh, Whiteham Woods, which is a forest. Uh, dominated by oak uh, in, in Oxford. And it basically the, the main emissions there is isoprene. And, and the measurements happened between May and October 2018 at four different levels in the canopy. So near the surface, at trunk level, 
uh, within the canopy and just above the canopy space. So um, on the left hand side is, is some of the meteorology from this campaign. So you can see um, uh, radiation, which is uh, photosynthetic active radiation or solar radiation. Um, that's the temperature. The, the gray shaded areas are the heat wave and drought period. So that's the summer period. And, and you can see that the temperature goes up during this period and soil moisture drops um, drastically during that period because um, the rainfall, which is these blue lines, basically stops until sometime uh, after the heat wave and drought period. So we've got measurements. And the next thing to do for me as the modeler is to apply uh, some models to the data. So we use a one dimensional model known as forecast and then um, used an emission model um, developed by Günther and others um, to try and understand what's happening um, with the um, data sets that we, we found. And, and the simulations cover from June to September 2018, which is basically the entire summer. So we do an initial model simulation where we just run the model as, is, uh, as the Gunther model is. And what we find is that, um, so if you look at, these are at different levels. So canopy top, mid canopy, um, trunk level and the surface. And what you can see is that outside the heat wave and drought period, um, we have the model which is in orange matching the observations which is in black. So outside the heat wave and drought period, which is uh, shaded by gray, the model is doing very, very well. But within the heat wave and drought period, the model is underestimated by as much as 40%. Um, and why that is the case, Well, we, we then have to compare and try to understand why the model is, is underestimated. So we compare the models underestimation with soil moisture, with temperature, and also with um, solar radiation. And what we find is that um, the model is underestimating at low soil moisture, below um, 0 0.21 meters cube per meters cube. Um, and it's, it's also, um, underestimating at very high temperatures, but that's understandable because um, isoprene emission is linked to temperature. Um, again, this is just confirming that uh, the model is underestimating during the heat wave and drought period, but doing well um, before and after the heat wave and drought period. So the model estimates are in the dash lines, which is um, closely and and the observations are in black for the various seasons. And you can see that before and after the heat wave, the model is doing relatively well. It's close to each other. But during the heat wave, which is in the orange, the model, which is in the solid line, is underestimating the observations, which is in the dash lines. And why is that happening? Well, so the, the theory behind isoprene emission is that um, the plants taking carbon dioxide for photosynthesis and a percentage of that photosynthesis is re-emitted as isoprene. And so when photosynthesis declines as a result of drought, then isoprene emissions also decline. But what we found is that actually in the initial phase of drought, isoprene emissions increase um, before it eventually declines just as photosynthesis declines. But at present, we are modeling it wrongly. So the, the Gunther algorithm basically was wrong. And so what I did was to change that and add new equations to the, the model to be able to estimate, get a better estimate of isoprene emissions during drought and heat wave. And, and so here is um, the different um, experiments that I did. Again, this is the same plot that I showed before. So we, I did an experiment using leaf temperature, um, 
and then using soil moisture. And you can see that by the end uh, with the last experiment, that model under estimation, so the model is in the different colors, red, green, and blue, and the observations are in black. And you can see that by the, uh, due to the new equations that I've added into the model, the observations and the uh, model are closely in agreement at this point. And, and then and the estimation uh, is reduced to less than 5% um, from 40% to less than 5%. There are just a few places where uh, the model continues to underestimate. So basically uh, what we, we, we conclude from this is that um, at present, models are not taking the full effect of droughts and heat waves on isoprene emissions uh, into consideration or BVOC emissions into consideration. And as I've already indicated, these BVOCs play a very important role in, in, in our understanding of what's happening in climate because of its impact on chemistry and so on. And therefore, if we're getting that wrong, then we may as well be getting um, other things wrong. So things like um, how much carbon there is in the atmosphere and so on, all that is affected by um, how much BVOC is in the atmosphere. And it's important that uh, we get we get that um, right. And so what we showed through this um, uh, study is that we need to improve those, those models and we've shown a way to uh, be able to improve those models. This is basically um, a Taylor diagram summarizing the various um, experiments. So the base model is the original um, Gunther model, which I, I was using. That's in the yellow dots. So these dots, um, the, the observations are shown by a dot, as if you can see um, here, this, um, Right, and the closer um, the, any of the model dots are to these observations, the better the model performance. So you can see that um, at, with each model exper experiment, we are getting closer to the observation line. And that's exactly what um, you, we expect to have when you improve on, on the model's performance. So uh, just to point to what happens in, in future climate, we, we take this as sort of um, a natural experiment, a natural climate experiment, because as I said, the temperature uh, during this heat wave was about two degrees higher than um, the normal conditions. And, and so and, uh, rainfall reduced by as much as 90%. Soil moisture is declining. These are conditions you would expect in future from 2050, 2080 onwards due to climate change. So this sort of gives us a glimpse into what's likely to happen to plants and um, forest emissions in future when um, temperatures are higher than we, we currently have and, and what's likely to happen to um, the BVOC budget in the atmosphere. Okay, now I'm going to move on to uh, one more study, which is um, the impact of drought on um, plant productivity. So again, this is just going to focus on um, uh, photosynthesis rates at different forest sites and how drought affects those um, photosynthesis rates. And then um, in combination with ozone, Okay, so um, when we talk about ozone, for example, most people, the first thing that comes to mind is the ozone layer, which protects us against harmful um, solar radiation. But ozone, uh, as we know, in the troposphere is a greenhouse gas. And it is also um, a phytotoxin. It, it goes into the leaves of plants, and then causes damage to plant photosynthetic capacity and therefore reduces 
the ability of uh, plants to um, uptake carbon from the atmosphere. And, and its combination with drought is such that um, during drought, the conditions for drought, high temperature, high solar radiation, also helps in ozone formation. So you have a, a, a two-way problem. Um, the drought itself is affecting the plants, and it is also leading to the increased formation of ozone, which is, in, is also affecting the plants. So you have the plants have two different stresses affecting it simultaneously. OK, so um, as I indicated previously, there, there are different forest sites around the world. And so here we took three of them. Um, a Mediterranean site in Italy, so um, Castel Poziano, um, a US Mediterranean forest site, which is um, Blodget, and then um, a forest in Finland um, known as Hutila, which is uh, a, a, uh, basically it's pine forest. And, and these are different meteorology, different um, ozone concentrations, um, as you can see from these uh, plots, so different soil moisture characteristics and so on. We try to understand how um, drought affects each of these forests uh, over time. Okay, so just to give you a quick uh, introduction to how we model drought in, in these instances, I've already mentioned stomatal conductance, which is represented here by GS. And GS is calculated based on um, a series of equations. But then, as I said, when, when there's drought, stomatal conductance is reduced and in order to avoid um, losing too much water from the plant. And so during drought, we introduce, if you can see, the, this is the exact same equation, but if we introduce a term here called beta. Beta takes care of um, the drought impact on stomatal conductance. And beta is calculated based on soil moisture, um, the wilting point, and the critical kind of soil moisture at which drought has impact on, on the plants. And depending on the value you use for calculating beta, you can either get um, this shape or that shape. This, this basically allows you to um, deal with different types of plants. Some plants are drought tolerant. Some do not have that much of a tolerance to drought. So depending on whether you're using a drought tolerant species or a, not, a, a species that's not drought tolerant, you can use a different equation to be able to model the impact of drought stress on those um, plant species. So that's the basic equation. You calculate stomatal conductance and then you reduce it um, with this factor called beta and beta can be between zero and one. When there's enough soil moisture, beta is one, so soil moisture is not a problem. Uh, when soil moisture drops below the wilting point, beta is zero, which means that the plant is basically shutting down and going to wilt. And then in between zero and one is where um, the impact of drought stress on plants occur. Okay, so I, I'm going to summarize um, the main results from that study. So we've calculated plant productivity, which is called GPP, um, and we have some observations from different sites. And then we, we compare that with when the model is run without the impact of drought stress. So that is uh, shown as control. And then when we include the impact of drought stress, which is control plus drought, and when we include the impact of ozone stress alone, and then ozone and drought stress all together. So the observations, once again, are in black, GPP at the top, and latent heat fluxes below. So when you ignore the impact of drought stress, the model overestimates by about 30% in both instances. And when we include the impact of drought stress, the model, um, and the underestimation is reduced from 30 to just about 8% for GPP and 6% for latent heat fluxes. And then um, ozone also reduces it, but not by much. 
um, the best result, as you can see on the extreme right, is when both the impact of drought and ozone stress was taken into account. And here we're reducing the overestimation to less than um, 5%. So essentially, um, drought stress has a bigger impact on plant gas exchange than ozone, ozone damage. In fact, drought stress is the number one um, limiting factor for global photosynthesis um, or plant productivity. It is the biggest issue for um, plant productivity around the world. Um, and, and then there are other factors such as ozone, which also contributes. And, but the, the key issue is that you need to account for all these different stress factors in order to get a good um, match between models and observation. And why is it important? Well, we use models for estimating what happens in the future. We, we don't have observations of the future. And even where we have observations, as I've shown, uh, say for example, over Africa, the observations are very sparse. Now you use models to fill in the gaps between um, different locations where there are no observations. Um, and so you need to be able to get models that are closer to what we actually observe, which is reproducing what the plants are actually doing in order to trust those models, use them to create those data sets that our climate projections can be based on. Um, so th this, this is for present day conditions. And then we did a, an experiment for future climate where so looking at between 2040 and 2050, which is shown by the um, bars without stripes, and then 2090 and 2100, which is shown by the bars with stripes. And basically the story is the same. If we account for the impact of drought stress and ozone damage, we, we improve the models. And uh, again, the, the key message from and that experiment was that drought stress will continue to have a big impact in future, but then the impact of ozone relatively would um, decline. Okay, so I'm now going to, um, I'm, I'm coming to an end. Um, I just want to make a few comments about what happens in the future with respect to ozone damage, drought stress, and so on. Um, this is a plot from um, Sage Ital 2007, looking at the impact of ozone damage on um, forest productivity in present day and future climate. So present day conditions are on the left and on the right hand side are the um, future 2100 conditions. And basically what this is saying is that in future where we have high temperatures, high solar radiation, drought, and so on. Um, ozone concentrations are likely to increase, which is uh, shown here. And therefore, global GPP or photosynthesis could reduce by as much as 30%, especially in the tropics. Uh, the tropics are very important because they host most of the um, major forest um, biomes. So the Amazon, Congo forest, and so on are all in the tropics. These are huge carbon stores. These are huge places where a lot of photosynthesis occurs. And so if we're reducing those by as much as 30%, then there's a problem. Uh, even for our ability to uh, meet global climate change targets, such as the 1.5 degrees Celsius um, targets that we've set. Uh, and then the other problem with, um, say, relying on forests as, as climate um, change mitigation um, tools is that the forests themselves, um, as they mature, are no, no longer serve as a carbon sink. So they, they, they take in carbon, all right, but all the carbon is released back into the atmosphere. Uh, due to the absence of nutrients and so on. And this is, this is what I'm showing on the right hand side. So you can see that when you plant, if, you, if, if for example, we planted some forest 
in, in 2010, um, that forest will start taking in carbon for some time, but um, by say 50 years time, the, the ability to take in more carbon declines and therefore uh, we we'll lose that carbon sink from the forest. So just to uh, keep that in mind and, and to realize that forests are constantly being subjected to different stress factors, key among them being drought and that it has impact on emissions and also on the plant's ability to serve as a carbon um, sink. Okay, I'm going to leave it here. Thank you very much for your attention and um, I'll take questions now. Thank you very, very, very much, Dr. Otulabi for the great presentation. Um, and I, I believe um, um, people who are interested in asking questions could raise up their hands for me to allow them to come in. So, um, when you also have questions and you don't want to talk and you want to maybe type, you can also type so that um, you can easily read for the presenter to answer your question. So I can see there's a hand raised, that's um, JNAA. I, I don't know the name, but could you um, bring your question? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, that was a great presentation. This is Jeffrey. Um, oh, Jeff. Okay, Jeffrey. <laughs> Yes, um, Fred, that was a great presentation. Just a quick one um, on the, I think I joined in a bit late, but then I saw where you were showing um, the impact of the drought on the VOCs and yeah. indicating that the models show a sharp decline once there's, um, I mean, once the drought sets in. However, you see that there's an increase yeah. in the VOC concentration before the, um, the decline. Um, aside this observation we are seeing, I mean, the VOC in itself, how harmful is it? Because maybe I didn't join it from the beginning, probably you probably showed all those ones. So how harmful mm -hmm. is it? And if these are volatile, I mean, definitely, will, will they be residing more? Is, it, is the problem really the issue of the concentration levels or the issue with the residence times? Okay, and if that's the case, if it's probably the residence time, then is there sort of a removal process? So, so the VOCs themselves um, last very, very, they have a very short lifetime. Um, few minutes to say an hour. Um, the VOC has um, been, uh, it, will, it will quickly react with say, um, with NOx to form ozone, or it can form secondary organic aerosols very quickly, which will then become a, a cloud condensation nuclear or something like that. And so they, they are, their residence time or their atmospheric lifetime is very, very short. That's not a problem. The problem is how much of it is, is, um, is emitted. So in terms of isoprene alone, for example, um, the total amount emitted every year is about 500 teragrams. Now that's, the equivalent of, if you put all human beings on this planet and you weigh them together, the weight of all those human beings will be equal to the weight of isoprene emitted into the atmosphere each year. So it's, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's, there's a lot of um, isoprene being emitted into the atmosphere. And that is uh, because of the amount and its chemistry, um, forming methane, um, regulating hydroxide um, concentrations and so on. That is where the problem comes from. So it's the impact it has on chemistry, the impact it has on um, cloud formation and so on. That's where the issue is, not the residence time. Oh, okay, and then just as a follow-up, um, in as much as we are looking at the controls, we're also looking at advancement in terms of um, that's a going purely industrial and all that but then you know there are definitely some costs i mean costs that are attached to trying to be developed so how do we establish the balance in um, maintaining that level of you know advancement with human race and human technology and in tandem with also cutting down these emissions yeah and that'll be the last question yeah okay 
So the, the, in terms of these emissions, um, about 90% of, of BVOCs actually come from forests. They, they, they come from forest emissions. So there's very little we can do about the emissions from the forest, unless, of course, we are cutting down the forest itself. You don't want to cut down the forest just to limit isoprene or, uh, or other BVOC emissions. So in terms of that one, um, it, it's not, it's, we can't really change that. What we can change, it, for example, is, is the pre other precursors, for example, NOx. NOx comes from um, fossil fuels and so on. So if we reduce the NOx, then the reactions between isoprene and NOx to produce ozone, for example, you cut that link. Um, and, and in terms of the general question of the balance between development and um, and and taking care of the climate, I think we can do both. We, you can develop and still take care of the of the climate. Um, people often assume that the two um, are separate, but actually you can develop in 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 a, in a way that doesn't necessarily harm the environment too much. So finding alternative ways of, of doing things. Um, and luckily there's technology now that allows us to um, do things better. Transport, for example, you can, you can transport people better than using, um, if, if you have public transport, for example, um, one bus can carry maybe a hundred people instead of a hundred people driving themselves to work. That, so there are innovative ways to, to dealing with some of these problems. And humans usually rise to the challenge. All right, okay, thank you. I'm, I'm sure maybe, let me allow the rest. I would probably, this is rather bringing some other questions too, so maybe I'll come in later. No problem. Mm -hmm. no problem. All right, thank you. Um, we also have um, about three people raising their hands. Let me give way to Francis Kuju that you can come in, then the subsequent ones will be Daniel and then Leonard. So, Francis, could you? Francis. Please, you can go ahead. Hello, Francis, please, you can go ahead. Okay. Maybe maybe you can come in another time because um, all of time. So I'll give way to Daniel. If you could come in, you can. Okay, thank you for this opportunity. I'd wanted to ask with respect to the drought stress equation. I don't know whether we could go there. Yeah, pertaining to the threshold above the numbers at the left hand of the, the drawing or the outcome. I wanted to know how it's impact or its impact. Yeah, these ones. I wanted to know what it represents. So you mean the, no, these not the, not the one, so on. no, please. The Q is less than one, Q is equal to one. Okay, okay. I think I tried to, to explain, um, so, Basically, um, these allow you to deal with different uh, plant species. So some plant species are drought tolerant, some are not. So if you have a plant species that is drought tolerant, you, you would want the impact of drought to uh, affect it more slowly. So you want to follow this red line, for example. So in that case, you want Q to be less than one. And Q is this value here. All right. If you have a species that is not drought tolerant, you you can use Q is um, is greater than one, so that the impact is is stronger on the plant. Now, if you use Q equals one, you get a straight line between. In other words, the drought impact affects the plant linearly um, over time. All right, so the, these values yeah. basically allow you to deal with different plant species, depending on their okay. tolerance to droughts. Have I answered you? Yes, please. And with the formula itself, 
before you began the the whole section, you said uh, the drought is actually a two-way interaction. That's the biosphere and the atmosphere. But you were a little quick when you were explaining the formula. So I wanted to know whether the formula entails both the atmospheric uh, components and that of the, the biosphere component. Yeah, yeah so, so basically when, when, you, when you apply this equation to say um, stomata conductance, you will all, you will in turn, you'll be reducing stomach conductance, which means that um, you're also reducing the amount of water vapor, oxygen as well, that would leave the plant into the atmosphere. So you are, you're reducing the biosphere's uh, impact on the atmosphere. And obviously the atmosphere's impact on the plants is the reduction in rainfall, which has led to that drought. So you're, you're, it's a, you're looking at it from both sides, indirectly. Does that Daniel? Daniel, are you okay? Yes, please. I'm okay. All right. So um, we pave way for um, Francis Kujo once again, because I guess um, um, you said you had a problem with your microphone. Um, if if it's a problem, you could maybe um, type your question in the um, uh, in the chat box so that we can read it out. So we pave way also for Leonard. I die to also come up with his question. Uh, good afternoon, Doc. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Good morning. Uh, I'm doing something on the uh, GPP, so I, I I wanted to find out whether the impact of drought stress, based on the topography of the forest, there are differences in the impact of the uh, the drought, and also uh, the impact of drought stress for let's say temperate forest, same as Tropical uh, rainforest. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, in terms of, I uh, said, in terms of the topography, I, uh, uh, no, um, except of course, uh, what we have to find out is what's the soil like, because these values, these depend on the soil type. So, for example, if it's sandy, if it's a loamy soil. How much, how, how is that soil able to retain water? That's more important than the topography. But in terms of the forest type, uh, the, the, the climate. So you can see that the other study that I talked about was for different climates. So we had a boreal forest, we have a Mediterranean forest. The Mediterranean forests are used to drought. Drought occur more frequently in the Mediterranean areas than in the tropics. So those trees have adapted to drought conditions. Um, the boreal forest, for example, hardly has any forest. So when the drought occurs, then the, because those plants are not um, adapted to drought conditions, it has a bigger impact on, on, on um, those forests than the Mediterranean um, areas. Similarly, the, the tropical forests don't experience drought that often. And so um, depending on, on the location and how exposed those trees are to frequent drought instances, the impact will vary. All right. Uh, I hope Thank your you. answer has been given. Are, are you satisfied with it? Yeah. Yes, please. OK, so we pave way to Maureen. Maureen, can you come in with your question? Fred, thanks so much for your presentation. Um, I just want to ask, so in, in terms of uh, towards your conclusion, you were talking about the impacts of um, the tropics and its effects. So for for example, for us in Ghana here, for those, let's say, in the policy making or those who take decision, for those in the uh, agriculture or in the forestry sector and those, yeah, um, what will be the benefits or the impacts or lessons that they can easily take from these presentations? And what are the future of, let me say, actions that are needed to be taken to be able to avoid these impacts? especially based on the projections that we are seeing in there. Yeah. Okay, so the, if, if, I, if I meet a policy maker, the first thing I tell them is to fund the universities more so that they can conduct more research and, and be able to actually understand what's happening in our own forest. Now, 
you'd realize that most of what I've, I've spoken about or most of the research that's um, available on forests and so on tends to be coming from um, um, other areas in, the, in, in Brazil, in um, Europe, in America and so on, because they fund a lot of these research and, and the data is available and so on. Um, one of the main issues with, with our part of the world is that you really don't have a lot of the data sets. I know that um, um, UNE is now trying to put up, Caleb and co are trying to put up a tower, again, funded mostly from outside <coughs> to try and understand what's happening in our own forest ecosystems. So the first thing I'll tell any policymaker would be give them more money to be able to do the research that will inform policy. Um, research needs to inform policy rather than policy informing um, what researchers do. Um, so that would be that would be one. Um, in terms of giving advice generally, I would say yes, afforestation and things like that are great, but um, the, the main thing we need to focus on is how do we cut emissions? How do we um, actually grow our economy in, in a more sustainable manner? Um, because forests have their limits um, as to what they can do. All right, thank you very much. So um, just a follow up. Um, so in as much as let's say um, towards our region here, we do not really have much industrialization, I would say, whereby we see a lot of pollution coming from our end. So if we in our region continue to protect, now we are encouraging tree planting and others which like trying to create more forest areas. If we are doing all this and still the impact from the, the the bigger or the, let me say the advanced world is, or countries are still impacting. How do we still balance this equation? Still, researches will be ongoing, but how do we balance the equation? Yes. Um, so, th I think this is this is a, a very important question, and it, it's one of the there's there's something called um, climate justice, for example. So, the idea that poor countries um, cannot just sit idle and, and protect their forests and so on, um, whilst the developed nations continue to develop and pollute um, for the poor nations to try and, and, and plant trees and absorb. So those, those are climate justice um, questions. And it's important to, to balance them um, and, 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 um, and, and, and find a, a good balance between um, protecting the environment, so planting more trees, which itself is, is great because um, trees do more than just taking up carbon. They, they provide several ecosystem services. So if you have more forests, um, the environment tends to be cleaner um, and, and you have biodiversity um, and, and you protect your water bodies and so on. So forests, planting trees, are great for different reasons, but it has to be balanced against development, especially if, if that development can be done in, in a sustainable manner. All right, Maureen, please, are you okay? Okay, so um, can I see, I think I can see um, Papa G. Um, can you can you ask your question? Okay, please. Um, my name is Jacob, and Doc, thank you very much for the nice presentation you just made. And I, had, I am much more into uh, climate change communication because I believe that the key to addressing the impact of climate change um, has to be how we communicate to the people and how we make them aware of its impact both in the present and in the in the future. I see a lot of um, institutions like um, GMET, and I see the Forestry Commission is also on this platform. And I, I believe that as policymakers, they have a key role to play in trying to disseminate information to the citizenry, to let them be aware that there is a crisis that we are confronted with, which is the climate change 
um, crisis. And they must let people be aware of its negative impacts on our water resources, on our food security, and a whole lot. So that at the end of the day, if the citizens are being made aware of this, they can at least contribute the little that they can do in their various homes, in their various communities, so that we can all move along to combat this issue of climate change. So mine is just a contribution and it's a, a kind of advice to the policymakers that we, we have on this platform. Thank you very much. Thank you too. And, and I, I, I agree with you um, entirely. Okay, um, we also have um, Martin Adi also um, raised his hand. So meanwhile, there is a question in, I think that there is a comment in the in chat box. So Martin, finish yours. After that, we'll read the comment in the chat box. Yeah, I, I've yes, read the you. comment, so I'll, I'll just respond to it. You don't need to. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, okay. Thanks, so Martin, Fred, for yeah. your presentation. Uh, you made a point that uh, at some point, the forest cannot really uh, take in the carbon or serve as a, a carbon sink. So at that point, what do we do? At, at that point, um, you could actually harvest. So, so you, could, you can have a program of harvesting old forests and replanting them. Um, if you harvest that old forest, and for example, you use it in furniture or use it in buildings. So if we, if we, if we use it in building houses, in furniture, which will itself last for another, say, 50, 100 years, you, you are storing that carbon, which you took from the forest in the building or in the furniture or in, in something for another 100 years that carbon is not going back into the atmosphere. And then you replant those trees so that, um, replant those forests so that the new trees, the young trees can take up more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So if you plant that well, you could actually use that as a way of, um, of dealing with climate change so that you harvest trees that are too old and, and no longer serving as a carbon sink and in its place, you put new ones. The problem is that often we would cut those trees and will not replant them. So we deforest that area and that becomes um, a, a problem. But if it's properly planned, you could actually have a cycle. And in fact, um, in some European countries, they have these cycles. They plant fast growing trees, which they use in all these furniture that we import. And then they harvest them replant, harvest, replant, and so on. So that's that's one way around the problem. All right, thanks. Um, okay. So it, should I go to the comments? Okay, okay, you can go. Yes, um, so there's, there's one Fluxnet measurement that was carried out. Um, I've recently found this out from, from my colleague, Caleb. Um, but it's, it's a very short duration. It's just about five years of measurements. Um, and that, that data is available um, on the Fluxnet site. But broadly speaking, we don't have um, Flux measurements in Ghana, except maybe a few short um, campaigns. Um, that's different from forestry studies. The, the Forest Commission obviously does several studies on forests and so on. But in terms of atmosphere, biosphere interactions, um, we then have to rely on models or satellite data such as um, NDVI and so on to be able to estimate what's happening um, in, in, in the tropical region uh, mostly. So that's why I said we need to tell our um, policymakers to fund more, more sites and more research and more data collection. All right, thank you, um, Dr. Otulavi. Um, I don't know whether there are any other further questions. Um, I still never saw the comment or the, um, the message from Francis Kujo because I think he was having a problem with his audio. So um, since um, you can't still talk, that means that you have to lower your hands. <laughs> All right. And then we also, I think um, Dr. Ayi said he had further questions, but 
um, he wanted to pave way for the others to also um, um, ask their questions. So if you are still available, you can ask a question. No, no. So I think most of the questions were asked by the others. I think Maureen asked, um, and Fred was talking about the climate justice, because I mean, if the whole issue of planting will release more isoprene, all right? And then we are trying to also reduce the NOx emissions, but then just a, a few of us, or let's say in terms of by, I mean, taking countrywide population, the developed keeps advancing and then they rather keep advancing the, or sort of increasing the NOx concentrations. And we are advised to plant and plant, and then we also increase isoprene. Then it means in the end, instead of being, um, sort of instead of having a very healthy climate environment for us, it comes back to zero because I mean, we both are producing two extremes and the concentrations being so high would then definitely be to a global deficit in a way. And we all run at a loss. And I was also thinking um, one other aspect, um, in as much as the isoprene is released from very woody trees and plants, um, it's possible also to have some shrubs also releasing some minor concentrations that- And, the, and the, flowers and so on. Um, yes. Yeah. Sure, exactly. So we also are um, advocating for sort of these green roofing and all that. So I don't know if there's any sort of research into the concentrations that they also release, then that would give us a perfect story also, I believe. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, the main concern isn't really about, um, say, releasing, I mean, if, if, if for example, we could um, plant, say, the, the entire air surface with, with forest, the overall impact will be much, much better than the VOCs that it will release. So it's not, the VOCs are not, because their lifetime is, is, is very short. So um, it's, it shouldn't discourage us that, oh, we shouldn't plant trees because it will release BVOCs. Um, BVOCs are not really that much of a problem because, but it's, it's chemistry and so on is. And, and, and so, BVOC shouldn't discourage us from, from planting trees, but yeah, um, issues of climate justice and so on need to be um, considered, yeah. All right, thank sure. you. Um, okay. Just, okay. just a quick one. I don't know if maybe um, we could have some access to you know some of your works. I believe you, you probably have published some of them. I was expecting maybe you to show us where we could access some of them and then probably be able to read more uh, as a way of Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, so what I, I, I actually did that, so you can see that on these, I've actually pasted the, but I, I can share them um, later on with, with people. Um, sure, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, I can see uh, we still have Papa J's hands um, up, but if it's still the old one, then um, we will continue what we have to do. Um, for now, I can see that uh, um, people are interested in the works and um, for your information, the video of each recordings of each of our virtual series we made available and be shared with everyone. So those of us who um, would want to revisit what was presented, you can also assess them. And then um, I think I'll pave way for Maureen because she wanted to give an announcement on. Um, so Maureen, please come in. All right, so um, thank you. And thanks everyone who has been on this journey with us. I'll say ever since we started this seminar, this has been the sixth one. And I'll say we've all learned a lot. Um, so far, we've had a lot of presentation from Ghanaians. And I also like to entreat our other colleagues and friends from the diaspora that this seminar is open to all. We would like to learn from everybody. So I'd like to use this opportunity to invite other presenters. If you have any presentations which you would like to share with us, more taking into consideration our stakeholders, our users, um, it's whatever we are doing in the sphere of atmospheric science or any weather and climate related issue, please you are welcome on board. Um, all we want to um, enhance is to, to improve our knowledge and then 
or things that we are doing in this, in, in this kind of sphere. So I would like to use this opportunity to invite all of us, if you have any presentation you want to share with us, kindly send your, your request through the email. Um, we will do the backdoor arrangement and then we'll see how best we can um, shadow you for our, our seminar for us to learn. So we we'll also want to hear from other countries as well. So thank you very much. And we're looking forward that this seminar will grow to become one of the great impact that will bring um, younger generation, especially in the sphere of atmospheric science, and then help us to be able to develop more things that will help us within our sub-region as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, yeah. I just wanted to say that if, if you turned up hoping to hear more about meteorology and so on, then um, sorry, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not too much into meteorology these days, but I hope you found something useful um, from the presentation. Sure, sure, we had it. Hi. Yeah, yeah. That, I think um, it's unfortunate we couldn't um, have people registering with their institutions and um, where they are recently, you know, based. Yeah, but I think it's um, it's laudable for us to do it. We can even type it right now in our chat so that we can easily identify anyone who um, participated in this particular um, seminar series. And then um, um, I think it would be good if we could take a picture for record keeping. So if you can turn on your video cameras, it will be very nice for us to take a, a picture of it. And then um, Dr. Frederick Otulabi, we are very grateful for your time, um, for everything, because in fact, you have really opened our eyes. Um, people are really interested, especially those of us who are more into climate. Yeah, so it's a very good thing. and. Um, keep up the good work. Yeah, so we also open way for others who have also done other researches within this particular domain to also um, um, share their work. But that one, like Maureen said, you have to come under, uh, you know, back door for us to also assess it before we allow you to present. Thank you. So we can turn on our video cameras so that we can take the, um, Photo. Okay. Are we ready? Some people's camera is off. Yeah, okay. Okay. So the paparazzi will see one, two, <laughs> three. Okay. Four. Five. <laughs> Okay. Thank you so much for the time and the um, opportunity to also listen to our presenter. Thank you so much. So um, on behalf of the team here at Ghana Meteorological Agency and then the KNUSC team, we um, bring this session to this um, to a close until we meet another time. Um, it's bye for now. All right. Bye bye. Yeah. yeah. Next month, we'll bring you an interesting um, session as well. So we entreat all of you to be on board. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Bye bye. Sorry, I couldn't join you today, but I think I will. I missed today's session. Oh, uh, yeah, bro. But we have the recorded question, so you definitely have it. Yes. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye.